Amen. How many has your Bibles with you this morning? If not, you have a phone with a Bible app, and that is sufficient, right? All right, turn with me, if you will, to Psalms chapter 23. I've never preached out of this passage. I've, I've, I've quoted it, of course, and I quote a lot of Bible when I preach, but I've never just begin to get such revelation. I want to tell you, first of all, that what I believe that I'm going to dive off into this morning is definitely not going to be the first or the last time, um, well, it will be the first, but it will not be the last time that I talk about what I'm getting into. And I believe that what I'm beginning to discover, and for those of you who don't know, I have been on a mission for many years now, seeking the authenticity of what apostolic reformation really is. Somebody say apostolic reformation. Apostolic Reformation doesn't mean I'm of the Apostolic Church because, you know, some of those are like, I guess, the oneness type people. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I never went to the quote-unquote Apostolic Church. But I'm talking about apostolic in the sense of first century apostles, apostolic doctrine, apostolic truth and faith. And um, discovering or rediscovering what it is to authentically be the church in the 21st century. Because a lot of times what we don't understand, I think, is that we feel that we have to begin to change everything up because things change around us. But even though I, I like lights, I like, I like um, flashing lights, I like everything that we can add to a church building as we expand and we grow in this church plant, ultimately the message it stays the same. But let me say this. It's not, it's not only that the message itself stays the same. It's that I think we have forgotten the narrative of the message somewhere along the way. And so the message, is, it's actually changing, but it's not changing because we're trying to change it into something else. It's changing because we're trying to bring it back to what its original tent was. Let me say that again. We're trying to find the message to bring it back to its original intent. The original narrative of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ was not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the message that the Lord Jesus Christ preached. And the message that the Lord Jesus Christ preached was the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, amen. Um, can you adjust me just a little bit, Eric? I, I mean, I'm loud, but I feel like, um, I don't know, like muffled or something. I feel muffled. And what the Lord, yeah, that sounds a lot better, whatever you did. Okay, and what the Lord has begun to, begin to deal with me about is something called the table. The table. And when I begin to look at the table, I begin to walk into something. My eyes begin to open up, and everything that I've seen from movies, let's say King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, to um, uh, I, there's a TV show that I, I'm watching a little bit now, I probably better not tell you what it's what it is it's not that bad but they gather around a table to make decisions and i begin to see this table and i've seen this table and we've always had round tables and prophetic round tables and we would meet at tables and there's something about a table that began to really um pop out to me but now i'm beginning to see the 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 intent of the table is much more watch this the intent of the table is much more than just having an apostolic round table or prophetic round table on a friday night it has to do with the communion of the entirety of the church itself corporate now let's start in verse 4 of chapter 23 we all know we you know this is a lot of people like to, to quote this at a funeral but i'm not going to be preaching a funeral message this is a message about a living and going through and finding out what god is building while you're going through let me say that again it's about finding out what God is really building for you while you're going through what you've been going through. All right, let's start at verse 1. I guess it's not very long. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, I, I grew up so backward and so backwards that I read this when I first got saved. And I said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm like, I, I really want you, Lord. I mean, I do. I'm like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I'm reading this, like, why, why, would, why would David say he doesn't want the Lord? You know, I didn't understand. I will not lack. <laughs> it was what, is, you know, I begin to look at it and say, you know, I thought the word yoke was egg yoke. I didn't know it was like a yoke of oxen. You know, the thing they put around their neck. I'm saying, then the anointing will destroy the yoke. I'm saying, how in the world, what in the world has the anointing got to do with destroying egg yolks? <laughs> so I had a lot to learn on my journey. 
<laughs> and that's 16 years ago, so you guys, you got to know I've come a long ways. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall want. No, I shall not want anything. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside quiet waters or still waters. I'm in the New American Standard Bible. He restores my soul. Somebody say amen right there. He restores my soul. I'm telling you, sometimes we go through so much in life that if it wasn't for God restoring your soul on a daily basis, we would not be here this morning. We would have already lost our minds. We would have already given up. We would be doing something else besides serving God because sometimes what we don't tell somebody is that when you really serve God, there's some pressure that comes into your life. When you really serve God, you come into a fire that begins to consume and heat up up everything on the inside of you and you don't know what's going on because you don't understand the pressure but he restores your soul Jesus have you ever restored a room? you ever restored a house? Have you ever restored anything? Some people like to tinker on cars and they like to buy old model cars. Somebody might buy a 1967 Chevelle and they're going to restore it. What does that mean? It means to bring it back to its original intent. Oh, hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost already. What he's doing, he restores your soul. It means he's going to take your soul, your will, your mind, your emotions, every broken part of your mind, and he restores it back to its original hey he's gonna restore it back to its original intent I know you've been through hell in 2016 but I'm telling you to I'm telling you today that no matter what you've been through the enemy is reaching to you and trying to rip your mind apart try to destroy your will try to rip apart your emotions he's trying to take it down but the Lord in this season he is restoring your soul oh hallelujah he's bringing it back to its original intent and its original purpose Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. He's going to restore everything the enemy has stolen from you. He's bringing it back to the original intent, the original frame of purpose, working in you for his greater glory and his greater purpose in order to equip you to fulfill your destiny. You can't live your life. You can't walk this thing out with a soul that's all fragmented, with a soul that's all messed up. Oh, your mind's been jacked up, busted, soul ties. But God is saying, I'm about to bring you back to your original intent, to your original purpose. Oh, help me, Jesus. I'm not even. And I'm a shaker. I'm not even at the place I need to get to. How is this about a funeral when he's restoring your soul? He's not laying it to rest. He's lifting you up out of the miry clay and the horrible pit. Hey, he's setting your feet down upon a rock, a strong foundation, and he's establishing your goings. Restore. Ah, somebody shout, Restore. Say it again, Restore. Original tent, original purpose. I know some people are double minded. Some people, if the doctor has even told you that, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I need to say this. Some of the doctors have told you you're bipolar. You're not bipolar. The devil is a liar. You're just Daisuke. You have a divided soul. But the Lord, He's going to restore. Ah, it's a promise. You need to grab a hold of it. You wrestled with chemical imbalance. You wrestled with the lie of the enemy. But the Lord's going to reach inside. He's taking all the broken, fragmented pieces. He's putting them back. He's restoring. He's restoring your soul. Jesus. Jesus. 
Thank God he restores my soul. There's times I know that I go through turmoil. I go through a lot of things in my mind, not knowing what tomorrow is going to hold. But I thank God that his mercies are renewed day by day. And in the morning time when I wake, I find out that no matter what I went through the day before, he restored my soul. Oh, Jesus. I know darkness endures for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. Joy is when he restores. Joy is when he restores your soul. Heard I say there's an anointing. There is an anointing that changes everything. There's an anointing that changes everything. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. It's about him. Somebody say it's about him. It's about him. Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Let me say something right here. What you're walking through is really, really not an enemy. It's a shadow of something that wants to make you think that it can touch you. But a shadow has no power. It only has a, a visual about it to make you think that there's something there that can touch you. Death may cast a, death may cast a long shadow in your life or whatever it is that you're going through. But it's only a fleeting shadow. It's meant to jack you up in your mind. To make you afraid of the journey that you're walking through. So many people start strong but they finish weak or they don't finish at all because in the process in the process of trying to walk out your faith you find yourself in a valley and in the valley you are surrounded by shadows and the shadows want to make you think that you're not strong enough to keep walking through your valley but the spirit of the Lord says this morning it's only a shadow hey it's only a shadow hallelujah it's only a shadow. It's here for a moment. But even though when the darkness that endures for the night, but the joy that comes in the morning, the moment the sun rises in your life. Hey, I said the moment that the sun rises up in your life, every shadow is cast out. And, uh, how am I going to preach this? I don't know how I'm going to preach this because I... I don't know how I'm going to get to it. Yeah. I know your K, King James Version says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the new NASP says, Even though I walk through that, just, you know, it's how we talk. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, it's, it's, it's never telling you that you're not actually going through something. This is what you need to pick up in your spirit. It is not a denial of what you're going through. It's a respect to you that you are going through something. It's respecting the reality that what you're walking through is real. But what is real cannot harm you. What it does is it tries to ensnare you in order to trap you to keep you from moving on in your life. See, the enemy, he may not can... If he cannot kill you, and the Lord wouldn't let him kill you. If he couldn't kill you before you got saved. If the overdose didn't take you out. If the STD didn't take you out. And everything that the enemy threw at you couldn't take you out. Then what happens is the enemy's going to try to put you into a place of fear. Perpetual fear in order for you to keep going forward. Because proceeding through the valley is your process to your victory. Yea, though I camp out in the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I build a house in the valley of the shadow. Too many people have built their house in the valley of the shadow. Hey, Jesus. You're living in a life of twilight when God is wanting to bring you to a place of life and life more abundantly. Yeah. 
We walk in, you're walking through a shadow, a valley of shadows. I'll tell you, let me share with you. One night I was, I've been married 12 years, almost. I was thinking 13, she corrected me the other day. And she's right, I, I just, I don't know why it seemed, th- I thought I, we were 12 and going on, but anyway. Before I married her, probably around the year 2000, is way before I married her, probably around the year 2002, maybe 2003. I, w- I think it was 2002, I was asleep in my bedroom and I woke up, and when I woke up, I heard the Spirit of the Lord say to me, spiritual warfare. When I heard this, I got out of the bed, I flipped the light switch, and the lights did not come on. I opened up the door, walked into the living room, and I was surrounded by shadows. And every one of them had yellow eyes. Two eyes. Each one had two eyes. Yellow slants of eyes. And they were all around me. And they jumped on me all at one time. And I'm wrestling these things. And they're about to take me down. And then immediately up out of my spirit, I begin to declare the word of the Lord. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. If God be for me, then who can be against me? Nothing is impossible to those who believe. And as I begin to quote the word of God, I begin to throw these things off of me like they were nothing. And then immediately, I'm sitting up in my bed. So I can say, rather in my body, out of my body, I know not. I'm sitting up in my bed. I'm I'm like, what just happened to me? I was walking through a valley. And I'm going to tell you, in the midst of the valley, the Lord is trying to empower you to be able to keep walking through it. I'm telling you the thing that the enemy knows is that when you're walking through the valley of the shadow, that the first thing he's going to try to do is make you to grow weary and well-doing for in due season. He doesn't want you to get to a due season. He wants you to keep walking in this valley and eventually just taking the valley to be the part of life that you got to live out. The valley was never meant to be a place to live in. The valley was a place to walk through. Too many of us, we decided I'm going to live here. I'm going to build my house here. I'm going to raise my kids here. I'm just going to tough it out. I don't like it here because in the valley of the shadow of death, there's nothing happening in your life that's of a spiritual inclination of growth and magnitude. In the valley of the shadow is a place of darkness. There's no growth. There's no harvest. Everything's hard. Everything becomes difficult in that season of your life. And if the enemy can get you to stay there, then you're never going to be able to walk through. And walking through is the ability to go out the other side. For everybody that's called of God, whether you're called to, to ministry, whether you're called to fivefold, whether you're called to business, arts, and entertainment, whether you're called to government, whatever you're calling business entrepreneur, stay at home mom, or stay at home grandma, whatever your calling is, the enemy does not want you to be effective. So he wants to bring you through a spiritual valley to get you to stay there, to destroy your effectiveness for the kingdom of God if it can destroy your effectiveness then you're never going to have the reality of the promise in your life I am so far away from my message and maybe for next Sunday we'll get there when we get there let me keep breaking this down Uh, the process is a walk somebody say it's a walk it's a faith walk. Because you can't, and while you're walking through the valley, you cannot be moved by what you see. Because what you see, because what you see is only temporal. What you see is temporal, but what you cannot see is eternal. And many of us, we don't look at what's eternal because circumstances messes with our mind. Come on, I know I'm talking to somebody circumstances mess with our mind the circumstances of life will make us think one way but the reality of what God sees is something completely different so the process must be a walk because if it becomes a stop 
Many of us, we don't understand the blessing of the Lord because somewhere in the middle of life's journey, we stopped in the valley. Asha. Here we, let me tell you, the valley comes for us all. It may be, it'll manifest differently in everybody's life, but the valley comes for us all. But it's through the process of the valley that the Lord is getting us ready for kingship. Without David's valley, David had no throne. Without the valley, you have no dominion. Without the valley, you have no blessing. Without the valley, you do not have the purpose and intent of God for your life. We walk through it. Because we know on the other side, there are exceeding precious promises. We know that the tribulation or the trials that we're walking through now are working in us a far greater weight of glory. I know preachers right now, they stopped in the valley. Ministers, I can't go any further. I'm going to stop doing this and I'm going to start doing You can't stop in the valley. Because the enemy wants to make you think that your promise is dead. Shadow of death. It's a mirage, but it looks real. So to you, it looks dead. But in reality, it's just a mirage. What do you think Abraham did when he held up his knife to kill his only son? Oh, that's a valley of a shadow of death right there. Because he considered him dead. The book of Hebrews said, watch this. The book of Hebrews said that he believed that God would raise him from the dead even if he put the knife to him. Because he trusted the promises of God over his life. And I, Jesus. You got to believe that no matter what you're walking through this morning, that on the other side, there's victory. And through it all, there's a promise. And that promise is resurrection power. He's going to restore your soul. He's going to give back to you everything that the enemy has stolen. It ain't over yet. Hey, it ain't over yet. It's not over with. I know the devil thought he had you. But touch your neighbor and say, Neighbor, what the enemy intended for evil, God intended for my glory. Hey, we're going full circle. We're going full circle. Uh, the devil is a liar. Even though I walked through, I walked through, I walked through, I walked through, I walked through this valley of sh the shadow of the death of my promise. The valley of the shadow of the death of what God told me. The valley of the shadow of death of my marriage. The valley of the shadow of death of my finances. The valley of the shadow of death of my business. The valley of the shadow of death for my grandchildren. The valley of the shadow of death for my son. The valley of the shadow of death for my daughter. The Lord says, keep on walking, honey. It's only a shadow. Hey, it ain't what it appears. You don't look at what you see. Because what you see is only temporal. Look at what? Look at what you can't see. Because what you can't see is eternal. I'm about to lose it up in here. It's just a shadow. It's just a shadow.
catch this. Catch this if you can. The substance of death was left on the other side of the cross. I want to run, but there ain't no room in here. Woo! Catch this, catch this. The substance of death is on the other side of the cross. If I was baptized into his death, I was raised up into his likeness. That the same resurrection power to raise him from the dead quickens my mortal body. I'm alive in him, which means everything that has the presentation of death is only a shadow. I don't care if it's physical, by his stripes, you have been made whole. I don't care if it's mental, he restores my soul. I don't care if it's spiritual, because I'll be strengthened every day by his spirit and my inner man. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Let me talk to you about your reality. In Him, in Him, that's God our Father, Yahweh, and Him, there is no shadow of turning. So what you see, don't be moved by, because what you can't see, there's no shadow of turning. Thank you, James, for writing that. In Him, there is no darkness nor shadow of turning. There's your KJV. Woo, ha, ha. Ah, Jesus. In him there is no darkness, nor is there a shadow of turning. In him is life, and life, and light, and the light, and the life is the life of man in the beginning. Hey! In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It don't matter what the devil says. God has already chosen you. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 4, you were chosen in him before the foundations of the world. Before the enemy chose you, God had already chosen you. Before the devil said, I want him, God said, it's too late. I already took him. <laughs> Says, I, I'm going to have that one. God, the Lord says, I don't beat you to it. Hey! It's only a shadow. Reality begins to set in, and you begin to declare, Thy word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path, which means it destroys every shadow that tries to lean over into your life. The greatest weapon you have as a son and daughter of God is this right here. You can say, thy word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet. It is a light under my path. I will not walk in the way of the wicked.
Watch this. So then blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Who are you listening to? And a guy on Facebook. He pressed. First he got after me on one of my posts. I delete. Delete. I can delete as quick as I can cast out a demon. Delete. Delete. So he inboxes me. He said, brother, was your father a Pentecostal preacher? Because you're preaching kingdom and da da da. You know. I said, I, I said, first of all, I said, I wrote him back. I was cordial first. I said, are you asking me because you want to be my friend? Or are you asking me because you're trying to be my accuser? I said, for your information, my father died at the age of 49 in 2008. And I said, as far as I know, I don't even know if he made it to heaven. Well, he said, well, brother, brother, brother. he just went on. No mercy. Listen to me, not to get off track. But this is a season if you want mercy in your life. You better be merciful. And I'm not talking about unsanctified mercy. I mean, if you're behind the pulpit and you're shacking up, look, you need to sit down and get it. That's righteous judgment. There's a difference. But when people are repentant in heart, you better wrap your arms around them. You better say, you know what? We've all messed up, honey. We all been through some hard things. But this season, I'm giving you mercy because I don't want the beam in my own eye to come out and bite me in my. I don't want it. I don't want the beam to bite me in my donkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I can't be merciful to those who are going like, to. I don't. Quit trying to get the speck out of your brother and sister's eye when you got a beam sticking out of your eye. Come on, somebody. You've been judged. You've been ridiculed. You've been ostracized. You've been excommunicated. Well, let me tell you something. It ain't the real church, honey. The real church. They learn how to sit down with authentic apostolic authority. I'll get into that probably next Sunday. I got to talk to you about the table. God, because I just to highlight before I keep on reading, the highlight of this is the reality is that God is changing the paradigm of how we see church from a place of pulpit ministry to a place of table ministry. Now watch this. I'm not talking about deacon ministry. There's two different tables in the Bible. One table is where widows are at and where people need to be taken care of, where the apostles said it's not wise for us to, to neglect the, the ministry of the word and the ministry ministry of prayer to weigh tables but there's another table where we get together in order to have a voice as a family there's so much in that I don't have time to get into that today but I'll save that but let's move on so what is happening here you walk through a valley and the valley is a shadow of death because your present reality is the light of God which has no darkness and he has no shadow of turning Wow. I fear no evil. You see the consequences of the shadow. The consequence of the shadow is to bring forth fear. Fear contaminates faith. Did you hear what I just said? Fear contaminates faith. So when you're given into by a spirit of fear, let me tell you what fear does. Has anybody ever been around a dog that kind of looked at you funny and you're like. This is true. I've been bit twice. I had a pit bull get me on my hand. I've had a child take me by my leg when I was about 11, took me to the ground. I don't fear dogs. I feel like I'm almost, if I could have got a different, different calling in life, I may have been a dog whisperer. I, li I like dogs. I'm good with them, <laughs> for the most part anyway. And when a dog wants to growl at me, I take dominion over him. Because if I show him fear, he picks up on fear. Now, the secular world will call fear energy. And will call faith energy. 
people who have faith that that dog can't hurt them is positive energy. Now that's, that's new age. They're just stealing it from the church. It's actually faith because it voids the concept of fear. Faith voids the concept of fear. When a dog wants to growl at me, I'll look at him and say, shut up. Say, hush. Say, hush, boy. Most of the time, I'll pat him on the head. There was one dog I couldn't do that weight, and I won him over. I found out that he liked ice, and I brought that dog ice chips, and he loved me from that point forward. <laughs> but there's a way. There's a way to overcome. What I mean by that, sometimes fear doesn't go away just because you tell it to shut up. That's coming from a guy that suffered right after we got married. In the first year, I had a panic attack that lasted eight months. I, I thought I was dying. I didn't know what was wrong with me. During that time, I would have dreams that I was being tossed by waves. And the waves would toss me. The one night, I was being tossed by waves. And I fell into a pool of the water with black serpents everywhere. And they, with fangs, they lashed all over my body. The enemy was trying to kill me and take me out through fear. And fear had gripped me to the point. It wasn't, I wasn't afraid of anybody. It was, a, it was something that just came on me that I didn't know how to shake it. And I began to have dreams that I would surf. I was trying to. And I would try to get on the surfboard. I've never surfed in my life. But I would dream that I was trying to surf and I couldn't do it. I'd paddle out there and then the waves would roll me over. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. You could just grab it and hold on to it. It's, thank you, sir. I would be rolled over in these waves and eventually, I started dreaming where I would get on the surfboard, and I was riding it. And what I learned is that the fear that came into my life was a spirit. And uh, anybody ever heard of John Kilpatrick? Anybody ever heard of the Brownsville Revival? Okay, he came out of that. He was the pastor of the church. I don't listen to him very much, but I saw a message on Facebook the other day. And sometimes I find things on Facebook that are really good. And I turned it on, and he was preached the message. He has, the name of the message was, have you received your thorn yet? So I began to realize that this was a thorn. I prayed, I fasted, I had every anointed, the biggest anointed people I knew of to lay their hands on me and to pray for me. That this thing would go away and it wouldn't go away. Fasting and prayer, fasting and prayer, and house cleaning and saying, is there anything in my house? So it's allowing the demonic in. What's going on here? And then I begin to realize as I would dream I could ride the waves, I learned that fear could no longer control me, but that I was able to manage over it and put it under my feet. What changed in my life? Did it go away? No, I learned how to step up on it. Woo! When you walk through your valley, you're going to have to learn how, in order to walk through, you're going to have to learn how to step up on what you're going through and not allow it to, to take you over and take you under. I learned how to step on it and I learned how to walk through it. And walking through it brought me to a place where I had victory over it. See, that's why I said that I will fear no evil but there's a reason you fear no evil why because Yahweh is with me the first thing the enemy wants you to think when you look at the shadow is that God has forsaken you but he's with you even when you can't see him some people say you know what I don't I don't feel just Delivered every day. I don't feel saved every day. Am I encouraging you? But I stay saved. Because I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved by what I cannot see. So just because I feel jacked up one day. Doesn't mean I stop serving God that day. Because even when I'm in a place that looks dark and bleak in my life, uh, when everybody feelingly, they turned their backs uh, on my life uh, and my wife and they walk out, uh, at the end of the day, uh, who do I serve? As for me and my house, uh, I will, I 
I will serve the Lord. Hey. It gets dark, it gets bleak, but you keep serving God. I know sometimes addiction try to take you back, uh, but you hold on. Uh, but let me tell you something. Uh, if you fall down, uh, get back up. Get back up. Get back up. I get knocked 74. Honey, if I get knocked down, I'm getting back up so fast you didn't have enough time uh, to see me down. Some of us got to be like Rocky with that thing that's trying to take us out. He's fighting Apollo Creed. Apollo Creed is very intimidating. He's the champion. He's knocked out the best of the boxers so far. Hey, but we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. You got to have grit. Sorry that I gotta go into a movie, but this makes such perfect sense. The man got knocked down. Get back up. Say, so come on. Come on. Take your best shot. You knocked down everyone so far. You might knock me down, but I'm getting back up. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. Says the Lord. I'm going to read this last part of verse 4 and I'm going to stop. Verse 5 is where I want to get to. But I'll get to it next week. I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Watch this. When you learn to not lean on your own understanding, but you acknowledge him in all of your ways, he'll direct your path. Now the staff is to lead you. The rod is to destroy whatever is attacking you. Psalms 110. The Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh said to Adonai, or the Father said to his son, Jesus Christ. I'm interpreting it for you. The Lord said to my Lord, David's Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You shall extend the rod of his scepter out of Zion, saying rule in the middle of your enemies. The Lord will not let you rule over angels until you can first rule over your enemies. You'll not judge angels until you can first judge the enemy. We are to render judgments in the earth, and you don't understand, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against demonic imps and schemes of the enemy. When we learn how to render judgment against the demonic powers that seek to destroy you and your family, you're going to find out just who you really are. You're going to find out just who you really are. When you find out who you really are, every devil in hell and out of hell, wherever they are, they're going to flee before you seven directions. What you don't know, we talk about the Antichrist. Do you know you got more power in your pinky finger than every Antichrist spirit on the planet? I don't care if it's Satan incarnate. The prince of demons, Beelzebub, cast him out too. He's already been defeated on the cross. That's why I said it's a valley of a shadow of death, not the substance thereof. Somebody say, but, 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 but pastor, that's, that was written in the Old Testament. Do you not know David was a prophet? That's right, David was a prophet. Now, she's helping me preach. High five. David was a prophet. 
And David is a prophet. Acts chapter 2, read it for yourself. David was a prophet. And majority of the psalms are prophetic psalms. And we look at, yea, though I walked in the valley of the shadow of death. That's not about David. That's about Jesus. It's a type and a shadow. Woo! Typology and shadow theology 101. Law of first mention. Let's, let's just blow our brains right now. I ain't even talking about David. That's David going through something, but he's prophesying concerning Jesus having to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Remember Acts chapter 2, you will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You will not abandon him to Hades or hell. I need to wrap this up. So it's just a type in a shadow. And we endure, because see, here's the thing. We are partakers of his resurrection power and in the fellowship of his. No, we, don't, we don't like that part. I don't want this on the podcast, so I'm going to say something real quick. <laughs> hey, I'm just wondering, you know, you reap what you sow. I had... I hacked my mother's Facebook the other day, and I wrote that I just blew a cheese booger out of my nose with pickles. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. No, no disrespect. Please don't get mad at me, but I've seen these posts. It says, would you slap your mother for $1 million? Like, heck yeah, I would. <laughs> and I'd give her a good payoff. Hey, she would not be mad about it afterwards. Mom, here's your car, here's your house. Now we're good, right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jesus, I wanted to get into this, uh, but I'm going to do it next week because I, I'm telling you there's a paradigm uh, that's coming to the body of Christ uh, that's going to bring us to a place where it's no longer about cheerleaders uh, and pulpiteers, uh, but it's about fathers and mothers, uh, sons and daughters, uh, and aunts and uncles. Uh, they gather around the table uh, in order to make righteous decisions. Uh, fellowship, oh, uh, Jesus. Oh, okay, 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 okay. And I have to finish the writing stuff. They comfort me. Now watch this. Do you know that oppression is the direct result of you not having a comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, in your presence? Let me pull it up. It's in Ecclesiastics. But I don't, I don't, I, I, my Bible's fairly new and I haven't got it all underlined yet. Ecclesiastes 4.1 says, I'm coming out of NIV because that's what it pulled up. Again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. ISIS, terrorist, genocide, racism, you name it. I looked and I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun and I saw the tears of the oppressed and they had no comforter the cure to the world's problems is the Holy Ghost it cannot be a church that preaches Jesus without the Holy Spirit because you have no power you may have some authority because the name of Jesus brings authority. But the power to transform nations is the power of the Spirit operating through a church. I saw the tears of the oppressed and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors because they had no comforter. Power is on the side of the oppressors because the church has yet to understand the function of who we are operating in the power of the Holy Spirit because we need to bring a world out of the valley of the shadow of death. The world is stuck in this valley and we are the only ones that can snatch her out. 
Let's pray this morning. I'll preach all day if I don't. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that next week I'm going to be able to preach on this table as we begin to understand and recognize the authority and power that sits at the table of a corporate anointing. Somebody say corporate anointing. Do you know that the corporate anointing is much more powerful than your singular anointing? You can do so much by yourself, but when we corporately begin to join together as a family, that means we're covenanted together. We've got each other's back. We can, we can rest assured that we're there for each other. We're going to step into a place of authority and power the world has never seen before. Jesus. Father, I pray right now that you begin to pour out your spirit. I break oppression. Come on, just stand to your feet. Those of you, I know a lot of us, we've been through some kind of oppression. You feel like you've been through this valley. God changed my message. He didn't change it, but he caused me to go to a different direction or a part of it this morning because, because of you. So I just prophesied this morning. Instead of preaching my message, I just prophesied to you. I got this as it, as it gave to you. I got it. Like maybe that's why it gets exciting to me because I get excited by the revelation too I'm telling you today oppression is ceasing today oppression breaks Father I thank you right now if it's been if you've never received the Holy Spirit or it's been a season since you've received the Holy Spirit I want you just to open up right now. He's about to come upon many of you. Receive the Holy Ghost. <sighs> Receive. 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 Yet I'm most shed out for second. Hallelujah. Come on, keep praying. Break in, break in. Holy Ghost power. Shine that home, my sack at the end. the Lord is saying there's some cyclical things it's not maybe sin but cyclical conditions um, cyclical worries cyclical things going on your mind over and 